Hello and welcome back to another episode of Hail Caesar Bootcamp. This is a Wargaming miniature series that we are going over the rules, explaining each and every um, rule and book in, uh, in detail. So let's go ahead and jump right into uh, the second video. The second video is going to be formation, command, and movement. And uh, if you haven't seen the first video, go ahead and check that out. It talks about the what's needed to play the game and the basic stat line for a unit. Okay, so there's a number of formations that you can use in the game. Let me go ahead and get these dice out of the way, because I think they're in the way for this whole purpose. All right, so we have some formations. The first formation is the battle line. That's when your troop is lined up side by side. You take all the bases and you put them side by side. Now, you'll never have a unit that is only one rank of figures deep. It'll always be two, three, or four ranks deep. Uh, this one is a two-rank unit of Romans, and they are in battle line, right? So far, so good. Now, uh, column. Column with infantry is slightly different than cavalry and other formations. But with infantry, it has to be anywhere between two and four figures across the front. And it must have more ranks of figures deep than it does wide. So if I took this unit, hypothetically, left him there, put these guys like this, that is all. That is four figures wide, but it's not more figures deep than it is wide. So that's not a legitimate formation. I have to continue like that. That is a column. Now, hypothetically, if I had a phalanx of four figures wide, and I took these guys, and I put them there, I am more than four figures deep, so that is a legitimate formation. You can have up to two to four figures wide, and the depth has to be more, not equal, has to be more than your width. So those are good columns. Open order. Open order is basically skirmish formation, like you might be familiar with calling it skirmish, but basically that's when every model is based individually and you're, and you're all about an inch apart. That's open order. Uh, light infantry, light cavalry, and light chariots can adopt open order. Skirmishers and horse archers and all tiny units are restricted to open order or column. So if it's a skirmish unit, they have to be in open order or column. Like other infantry and cavalry can only adopt open order when moving in situations when they could not otherwise move at all or when they could not move without incurring some penalties. This usually happens when going through wooded land, moving over rough ground or crossing rivers or other kinds of obstacles be forced into open order, but once you get out of the obstacle, like across the river or out of the woods, you would immediately go back into battle line. Now, some units like heavy chariots, artillery, and elephants, and baggage, cannot adopt open order at all, and this restricts their ability to move through some kinds of trains, like wood or rough ground. Okay, so that's open order, and these are columns right here. Now, there's a, there's a few more formations that only certain units can adopt, and one of them is the pike phalanx. Right? And the pike phalanx is four deep by whatever your gaming group's width is using. Now, I've, I've adopted a 32 figure, the small unit. Uh, the, it's actually the, the smaller number of the standard size units. So, like, this is a standard size unit, but it has to be like 32 to 40 or whatever it is. 32 to 40. And I've decided to go with the 32. So, here's 32. And that formation is unique to troops armed with the long pike or the cerisa. It's a spear-like weapon somewhere between 16 and 24 feet long. They fought in very deep formation. So we arrange our models in four, four model deep. That rep represents about 16 guys standing back to back. Because remember, this is not a one-to-one -one representation. And they do not allow pikemen to form into three or four two rank battle lines. They have to stay in the four rank phalanx. 
All right, then there's a war band. Now I've got a bunch of guys over here. Uh, this is representing a war band. It's not actually a war band. Yeah, there's some Germanic barbarian Viking figures in there, but there's also some English knights and stuff in there. I just basically grabbed a bunch of figures and put it on a movement tray. But a war band is a mass of loosely ordered warriors. Okay, basically they're guys that they're not trained to fight shoulder to shoulder. They're not all wearing the same type of stuff. They're all wildly colored, tattooed, and some have shirts, some don't, that kind of stuff. They're not, it's not a formal organization. And they are formed into four ranks deep, a lot like a phalanx. They look a lot like a phalanx. They're shaped exactly like a phalanx. Uh, and they're not allowed to form into two or three rank battle lines. Now, if it's composed of light infantry, which a warband can be, if it's composed of light infantry, they can go to open order as if they were medium or heavy infantry. Next thing is square. Later on, there was a formation that was developed uh, by heavy, medium, and light infantry to form square to def defend themselves from all four sides. And in a situation like that, you need to take uh, your models and you try to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? You need to have the same number of figures in the front rank as you do on the side ranks as you do on the back ranks. So this works perfectly fine because I've got four bases of four by fours, right? So I've got four by four by four by four. That's perfect for a square. If you had an odd number of figures, you would just line them up like maybe five by five by five by five and then a couple of figures in the middle. Uh, you just put a couple of figures in the middle. You can form square pretty much any way you want, but the sides all should be as close to the same length as each other. Now, that formation could represent a lot of different formations that were used that all it really represents is a closely packed formation of guys that could fight in every direction. And then the last formation is called, it has three names, it's called the Testudo, the Pig's Head, and the Wedge. Those are unusual formations, and we're not going to concern ourselves with those. Those will be explained when we get into unit special abilities. The testudo, the pig's head, and the wedge. All right, now let's talk about changing formation. Okay, we know that this is a battle column. There we go. So let's go ahead, and that is a phalanx. That's an open order. That's a warband thing. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about changing formations. Generally speaking, changing formation to another requires specific instruction when orders are given. Okay, so we're not talking about orders uh, right now. That's in just a bit we will be talking about orders. But basically, when you give orders to units, one of them usually has to be used to change formation. You could get zero, one, two, or three orders per unit. And if you get, and you have to use one of them up to change formation, if you want to do that. But we're just going to talk about the procedure of changing formation right now. It is very easy. What you do is, you find, if it's an odd number of guys, which I'm never going to have an odd number of guys for some reason, but if it's a, uh, you take the center of the unit, right, the center of the unit, or the command figure, the command stand, whatever you want to call it. So this base is considered the center of the unit, right? If I was over here, then this stand would be the center of the unit. Um, what you do is you remove the guys that are not the command stand. So far, so good. You turn this guy to whatever direction you want him to be. I want him to be facing that way. Then you line up your guys. in the formation you're adopting. So let's say you're adopting a column. Boom. Super easy. So and that was one movement, one of your orders it took you to do that. Let's say I'm in column and I want to change to battle line. What do I do? Same thing. Pull these figures back just, just to make it easy for me. I mean, you don't necessarily have to turn it back. Then I, I want to fight these guys, so I'm going to Pivot to face those guys. 
then we're going to adopt a battle line. Now, you want to try to keep that guy in the center, so you're sitting like that. Now, I could put this guy here or there. I've decided to put him there. And the command stand is right there. It's that easy, guys. It's that easy. There's nothing easier than changing formation. Okay, so let's talk about open order units like that. And we'll assume this guy right here in the red, he's the leader, right? He even if he's even if he's sitting there or whatever, when you decide to change formation, you pick this guy up, you put him in the center of the formation. And then you go, then you change formation into a line or a, yeah, into a battle line or whatever. With him in the middle. Let's say you're already in this formation and you want to, you're moving forward, you decide, hey, we want to change into open order. He stays there, doesn't move, and everybody spreads out in front and behind him until you get an open order with him in the middle. If you have a square, let's say that you've got a square and it's bigger than this, right? Let's hypothetically, let's just say I've got like, okay, let's just say that's part of a square because it's not full. I don't have all the figures. for. I would, I would need two more bases for a full square, right? And you've got, you imagine your command stand being in the middle. So we kind of take this off, right? We put him in the middle where he belongs. Right, and now we set up our battle line. Right, so squares are a little bit more difficult. Now, when you go to form a square from a battle line, you, you know he's your center. People are going to form in front of him. People are going to form behind him and to the sides of him. Right, because he's supposed to be in the middle. But you would need to have enough figures to go all the way around. Uh, in a situation like this, I might do something like that. I don't know. You're supposed to, uh, yeah, you just figure it out. Make it happen. Formations and tiny units. Okay, we'll take these guys off because they're not, my units are all going to be four by fours. Tiny sided units don't have proper formations as such and are always represented in open order or calm. We already talked about that. Front flank and rear. Super easy. Super easy. Let's push this back. I, those pikes are in my way. Uh, we're just going to talk about front flank and rear. Uh, I'm going to give these guys more figures just to not make them a square unit. Kind of like them. Just to show you exactly where the front flank and rear is. You take a 45 degree angle, and luckily these bases are perfectly square. So if you go from corner to corner, that gives you a straight line at 45 degree angle out. Same thing with these two corners, 45 degree angle out. Same with the back. Okay, so this quarter is the front. That quarter is the back. This quarter is the right side. This quarter here is the left side. How hard is that? Super easy. Done. That's front flank and rear. Now, if you're in square, you have no front flank and rear. It's all front. Uh, if you're in open order, you don't have any front flank and rear. It's all front. Okay, divisions. A division like this, we talked about this is a multinational division. Okay, this we got a multinational division of four units and one commander, right? So as long as the divisions are all within six inches of each other, you're there in cohesion. So you have they're within six inches, they're within six inches, they're within six inches, and the general is within six inches of any of the units. So they're in co cohesion. Okay, it doesn't really matter where you place them because he can't be uh, shot at, but you might want to, it's up to you how you want to position him, but I would put him like centralized in somewhere. Uh, and we'll get into that when it talks about commanders and combat. Okay, and we'll talk about giving orders and stuff like that, and units in cohesion like that, or divisions in cohesion, get an advantage. Okay, so let's talk real quick about the game rules. Uh, the game rules, uh, this is like a summary of the game rules, and then we're going to go into command and movement here in just a moment. 
game rules. Well, you got prepare to play. Basically, uh, you set up your table. Your you and your opponent decide to set it up. Kind of, it could just be completely flat. You could put patches of woods. You could do it any go any way you and your club wants to set it up. Uh, in some clubs, I've seen where like one player will set up and then the other player will choose what side he's on. Or in other clubs, I see that they would alternate back and forth on placing pieces of terrain on the table. And so uh, you can do it however you want. If you if you go by scenarios, then you just follow the scenario guidelines of where to set up the terrain. And it wouldn't be unimaginable to have like a heavy wooded area or, or some hills because of uh, uh, the, the the Romans had to fight on hills. They had to fight in over creeks. So and I'm just using Romans as an example. But yeah, there the Egyptians, the Carthaginians. You know, there's desert. There's uh, there's the Persians and Alexander. They had to fight. You know, around rocks and yeah. So you could do anything you want to do with your terrain. That's pretty much between you and your opponent. Your gaming club. There's no tournament way to do it. So. Uh, you can just follow scenarios or how, however your club wants to do it. Okay, so that's preparing to play. Now, a sequence of play is one side is considered the blue side and one side is considered the red side. And that's just the way they term it. It doesn't mean anything. It's just side one, side two, or uh, the Axis versus the Allies, or however you want to do it, right? Um, the good guys versus the bad guys. <laughs> and then so let's say the blue side goes first. Whoever goes first is the blue side. They have they issue their commands. They move. They do the range attacks. They do their hand. -to -hand then both sides do their hand-to-hand -hand combat. Then it's the red's turn. Red does their command. They move. They do the range attacks. Then both sides do hand-to-hand, -hand. and then it keeps going like that. Blue, red, blue, red, blue, red until the game's over. So you figured out who the victor was. Um, you might think that the blue would have advantage uh, because he gets to move first. Well, that's not necessarily true because with his command system, he might move into places he doesn't want to be, and then your opponent could take advantage of those poor moves. Or if you're the strategic kind of player that you are, you might want to see what is developing before you commit your troops. So sometimes it's better to go second. Okay, measuring distances. You can always measure distance. Am I within range? Is that fence close enough? Is is that stream over here within 12 inches? Is my general in the right spot? Is my opponent far enough away from me? Is he close? Are they close? You can do whatever measurement at any time for any reason, doesn't matter. I want to make sure that this tree is exactly two inches away from the temple. Whatever. You can make measurements from anything at any time. Okay, visibility. Okay, here's the tricky one. These are the examples in the rules. You measure from the center point there. From there, can he see this unit? Obviously he can. Yes. There's no building blocking, no other units blocking. Everything's good. He can see him. No problem. Can he see him? Normally I would say yes, but there's an obstacle in the way. That prevents him from, and I'm measuring from there to the closest points. It all goes through here. Can't see him. Can he see him? There's no terrain in the way. No, because you cannot see behind your front line. Your front line goes straight across. Remember the commander is standing in the center in the front. He cannot see through his troops to see that unit over there. All right, now here's something I want to point out that they leave it up to the players. Let's say this is there, right? Um, or, you know, so this guy here could see this portion of the unit, but he cannot see this portion of the unit. So could that unit see that unit? Um, that's a debate that uh, they leave it up to you as a player, and they say uh, rely on good sense and don't be slavish about it. So what they're saying is don't be don't be don't be a jerk. You know, just just be. It's all about fun. Uh, if if you think you should see him, then you should see him. You know, and your opponent. You know, 
still leaves it up to your good judgment. Okay, so use good judgment. Okay, when it comes to commanders, let's say there's a commander standing there. He w he does not block line of sight at all, right? You can see through commanders. You can see over commanders. You cannot see over friendly troops. So these two units are working together, and he's there. Excuse me. If he's there, he cannot see that unit because you cannot see over friendly units. They allow artillery to see over friendly units, and that will be explained later. Okay, they say that you should learn the game rules. Well, obviously, that's why you're here watching these videos. But you should. Uh, if any time you play a game, you should know the rules. But do you need to know all the rules? No, because, like, there's some medieval rules in this game that if you're playing a Roman game, you don't need to know those. Same thing, if you're playing a medieval game, you don't need to know about Testudo. Okay, there's other things like that. But learn what you need to learn. Before we get out of the game rules and we start entering into command and movement, just understand this. This is a game. This is not reality. This is supposed to be enjoyable for all parties. It's supposed to be fun to play. Everyone's supposed to have a good time. This game is not better than any other game. That's what they're saying. If you don't have fun playing this game, don't play it. If you love this game and you enjoy playing it, play it. There are some people that like to play Field of Glory. There are some people that like to play Armadi or what other, you know, other ancient battle games out there. Uh, there's games out there from Middle Ages. There's games out there. There's uh, DBA and DBM and all that. If you like those games, play them. That doesn't mean this game's better, but I will say... From my point of view, this game is better. All right, so let's talk about command. Okay, when you are um, in, okay, when it comes to your turn and you go to your unit or your division, your divisions want to do things. Uh, if you're a player and this is your division and you want them to move, you have to issue orders to them. Usually, it's relied upon the commander who has a leadership rating. Now, some units will get to move automatically, but we're not going to talk about that. We're going to be talking about command orders, right? So you nominate a commander to issue an order, right? So broadly speaking, you give an order, you nominate a commander to issue an order. Then you indicate the unit he wishes to move. So let's say this commander wants to get this unit to get off his butt and do something, right? And then you describe what you want the unit to do before you roll the dice. So it's like you issue the order, and then you see if it's executed. And that is the basics of the game. Basically, you say, Commander Joe Snuffy is going to issue cohort number one to change formation to a battle line and move forward as far as you can. You have to speak the orders aloud. All the opponents, all your opponents should hear what you're doing. Don't go... No, you got to you got to speak up. Let your opponents hear what you're talking. Don't make don't give them the dishonor of having to say, "What'd you say?" Good idiot. That's that's technically a form of cheating. Now, you don't need to have an order to shoot your bows or throw your javelins or fight with a sword and shield. You don't need any orders to fight, but you do do need orders to move. Yeah, so the order must explain where the unit is to move to and by which route in case uh, there's room for doubt. So like if you say he wants to go from here to over here, you might say he goes around this way or you might say he goes this way, whatever. Basically just make it clear and concise what you're saying. Now if you want a unit to move into hand-to-hand -hand combat with an enemy, then you must specifically state that you want to charge. And you must indicate which enemy unit or units you are intending to charge. If you want a unit to charge, then you must say so when giving the order. All right, so once you, once you issue the order, then you test for success. Uh, it's super easy. You roll two dice, right, and you're trying to get less than the unit commander's leadership ability, right? And so um, if the score is greater than the commander's leadership rating, then the test fails and no order is issued. Basically, they just sit there. <clears throat> okay. If it's equal, then they get to or uh, equal or one less than the order is issued, and the unit makes one move. If it's two less, two moves. 
if it's three less, three moves. Pretty simple, huh? Equal of one, two, or three. So let's say you're going up against a standard leadership rating of eight. A score of nine or more is a failure, obviously. A score of seven or eight gives you one move. A score of six gives you two moves. And a score of five or less gives you three moves, because three is the max. Now, uh, the odds of rolling less than your leadership becomes higher the higher the leadership is. So the odds of rolling, well, okay, let's say you've got an eight. The odds of rolling a seven, or not a seven, a six, the odds of rolling a six is lower than, let's say you had a leadership of 10 and you only had to roll a seven or less, right? So the, it becomes astronomically larger, I say astronomically, but it becomes increasingly larger or easier to roll two less or three less the bigger your leadership is. So what they're trying to say is avoid playing all those games with everybody having a 10 leadership is odd. So now commanders are uh, units, right? A commander can only issue orders to units belonging to his own division. If he successfully issues an order, like he says, I want you to move. He rolls. He makes it. This unit moves. And then he goes, okay, I want this unit to move. He rolls. He makes it. This unit moves. That's no problem. Then he says, I want this unit to move. Here we go. If he succeeds, he can continue to issue further orders to other units in his division. He can issue any number of orders so long as he continues to do so successfully. If, and as long as he's not issuing two orders to the same unit. If he fails to issue the order, then he cannot give any more orders that turn. Basically, he's done. This can sometimes result in some units moving and others staying where they are. And one commander must do all of his orders before another commander can start issuing orders. So if you've got two commanders, you can't go, he's going to issue one, then he's going to issue one, then he's going to issue one more, and then now this guy's going to issue. You have to stick with one commander until he's done, then you go to the next commander. Okay, now if you have multiple players on a side, uh, each of them can issue their orders to one commander simultaneously. That's only sensible if, uh, and then they go through their commanders one at a time. Uh, not the entire side, just each player. Okay, now remember that charge order. If you want them to move in hand-to-hand -hand combat, you've got to give them a charge order. The unit has to be in sight. So that means they were in the front and there wasn't anything obscuring them. And we don't worry about whether it's possible for a unit to charge. Let's say the unit is 48 inches away. You can still issue a charge if you wanted to. Woo. Okay, the important thing is that the unit has been given a clear order to engage that enemy. And you can be specific or general as a manner of players deem appropriate. For example, charge the elephant or advance to the ridge and charge any enemy that appear. And charge the enemy to your front would all be perfectly good. In the last two examples, you might all you might also indicate which units you think are going to be the ones to move. Now, don't give orders that are unclear or ambiguous, like charge the enemy. We'll return to charges during combat or movement. Okay, next thing I, I, is division orders. Okay, so remember, this right here is a division, multinational division, but it's a division, right? And now, we've talked about issuing orders to individual units and rolling individually and having them move, right? Okay, well, a commander can issue the same order to any or all of his units in the division. As uh, To qualify as a group, none of the units must be separated by more than six inches from the group that's given the order. So let's say this unit, and there's no restriction, but let's say this guy's way out there. He's more than six inches away. He's off the screen. You don't even see him. Right? He's there. <laughs> okay. He's more than six inches from any other unit. He can still issue his order to these guys. These guys can all accept the same order. It's one roll, they all obey. He can't do that for this unit. He has to roll separately for them. Same order to all units in the division as long as they're not more than, as long as they haven't already moved, and as long as they're not more than six inches from any other units in that group. And once they've moved, none of them can be more than six inches from an, um, another unit in the same group. In short, the group has to retain cohesion during that move. It is important that a division order is essentially one order which all units follow. Okay, so if the order was 
to advance at maximum pace, and you have a, 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 a unit of cavalry with you guys, the cavalry would not be allowed to leave the infantry behind. So you would remember the maximum pace would be fine, but you still have to stick within six inches. Now, if you want units in the same division to do different things, then you have to give them different orders. They can't be moved as a division. So to issue a division order, the player indicates which units will receive the order and test in a normal way. If successful, all units will receive the order and attempt to carry it out. If you fail, then the, all the units that failed to receive an order will usually remain where they are. Okay, distance modifiers. This is the modifiers. We assume orders are, are relayed by messengers who form part of every commander's staff or bodyguard. Because remember, he's not a, a lone figure out there. He's got his bodyguards with him. He's got his runners. He might even have a dog with him. And it's imagined that messengers might be killed or captured, delayed or distracted in some fashion. To re represent this, we apply a penalty to the commander's leadership rating if he is at a long way from his troops. Remember these guys over here? Note that skirmishers, light cavalry, and horse archers in open order are exempt from the penalties. So if that was a skirmishing unit and they were way out there, there wouldn't be a problem for that. That's kind of how they're supposed to operate anyway. So measure from the commander's model to the closest point of the unit being ordered. Same thing with the division. If he wants to issue a division order, then the closest unit in that group that he's issuing. If the distance is more than 12 inches, deduct one, and an additional minus one for every full 12 inches. So, so he has his full leadership within 12 inches. Oh wait, measure from his head. Yeah, he has the full leadership within that. Past that is minus one. Got it. Measurements are made from the the head, and that frees up your ability to make little dioramas for your leaders. Some of them will be on horses with bigger bases. Some will be on infantry stands. Some will be, uh, you'll have a chariot or you'll have an elephant or whatever. So you don't have to measure from the base. You measure from the commander's head. No distance modifier applied to skirmishers in open order or light cavalry that are in open order or horse archers in, guess what, open order. All right, here comes a fun part of issuing orders. Blunders. Um, you've, you've played other games like maybe bolt action and you've got uh, foobar, right? Well, that's what this is. It's called blunder. Technically considered an advanced rule. They're saying if you're a new player and you're, you haven't really understand the rules very much, ignore blunder. But if you want to fully incorporate the rules, jump into blunder. Uh, if you roll double six when giving an order, you blundered. Either an order has been misunderstood, or perhaps warriors are overcome by exceptional eagerness or timidity. Basically, you make that test, right? Uh, and if you get double sixes, you blunder. If a division has blundered, the same re result applies to all the units in that order. So you could have a major, you could have a mass blunder. Now, remember, units in open order don't have a defined front. The whole thing is the front. So for those pur purposes, assume the front is the part of the unit closest to the enemy, or the table edge, whichever is appropriate. Okay, so non-combatant units, such as messengers, scouts, civilians, and baggage, are not normally subject to blunders, but umpires should feel free to improvise that if he wishes. Okay, there's a blunder table. Once you blunder, you roll a die, it's a d6, and here are the results. One, uncontrolled flight. The unit turns around to face its rear, and then makes two moves into its facing quarter. Two full moves into its facing quarter. The unit will move even further if if necessary to clear the position of friends. So uh, once it's moved, the unit suffers one casualty to represent the loss of life and equipment suffered during the stampede. Okay, so if one unit is right in front of another unit, right, they turn around immediately and take a move but if you've got a whole two, have to take two mandatory moves, which is 12 inches for these guys, and if that puts them in a position where they are sitting on top of the friends, they get pushed a little bit more just to get them off the friends, because you don't want to have the the uh, models occupying the same space. All right, that was one. Then two, back. The unit moves backwards one move, but it continues to face towards the enemy. Three, drift left. The unit makes one move to its left. Okay, remember it's left, remember the quarters. 
that's left, that's right. You got to move into that area in a full move. So basically, six inches. Drift to right, same thing to the right. Five forward. The unit takes one move to its front and will charge if facing the enemy within one move's distance. And six uncontrolled advance. The unit makes three moves to its front. That's 18 inches. And it will charge if facing enemy within three move distance and which the unit is otherwise allowed to charge. Okay, so, yeah. <laughs> so you can have some guys going crazy. All right, that was blunders. Now we got initiative moves. Okay, an initiative move basically means the unit takes upon its own initiative to do its own moving without the orders of the commander. Uh, units that are within 12 inches of the enemy at the start of a command part of their turn are allowed to use their initiative to move instead of receiving orders. This represents the leaders of those units taking matters into their own hands or acting according to some prearranged plan or signal. The important thing is to remember is units that move using their initiative cannot also be given orders. So it's one or the other. All units wishing to move using their initiative must do so before any orders are issued. So you have to do all your initiatives first, then you go to the orders. Thus, during the command part of your turn, a player always moves using his initiative first and then issues orders to the remaining troops as required. And uh, what they're saying is, uh, if somebody forgets, they move one and they go, oh yeah, I wanted to do him by initiative, let it happen. Don't be, an, don't be a jerk. <laughs> okay. If they're forgetful, let it happen. But if there's a situation, I can't imagine one that is, but if there's a situation where a one unit moved a unit with an order and then now he wants to do an initiative move, um, if it would have had major implications to the situation, then don't allow it. But if it's just moving, just let, let them move. And you don't have to be able to see the unit to get the initiative. You just have to do it in 12 inches. And an umpire might override this if there's like hidden units and things like that that you're not supposed to know about. And if you are in initiative, or if you're using initiative, you can get one move. State the order, and you make your move. Now, you don't have to do initiative if you're within 12 inches of the enemy. You just can. Uh, one reason why you wouldn't want to is because you can't charge a unit if they're like 11 inches away. You wouldn't be able to charge them with an initiative move. You'd only move six inches closer. But with a command order, you got a chance of getting those two moves and make contact. Okay, free moves. In some situations, you're entitled to make one move even though your order was failed and assuming you have not blundered. A unit in column formation moves once even if it fails. That's good. That's an advantage. Columns will get a chance to move no matter what. All time units and scouts, parties, civilians, and such get a move even if they're failing. Baggage, carriages, wagons, they will get it as if they fail as long as they're on a road. And some units have a special rule. Now, units from broken divisions can move once they fail in order or if no order is attempted. However, such units are obliged to attempt to leave the battle where possible. Now, if you're doing a division order, and some of the units are entitled to a free move, and others are not, it's okay. If you fail, they still get their free move. Now, orders to units in combat, right? Units that are engaged in combat whenever fighting or supported, basically they're in hand-to-hand -hand combat rules, and they cannot be given orders and cannot be used their initiative. They must stay where they are while in combat. Now, some units have a special ability to allow them to ignore that. We'll go into that with the special abilities. Okay, there's also, believe it or not, there's flanking and things like that. So there's orders to off-table units. Um, there's two situations where you might have an off-table unit. Uh, basically, units that are beginning the battle off-table and they're moving onto the table. Uh, also, <coughs> and, and units that are off-table are usually designated like they have to enter on this road or they have to enter in through this river creek or whatever. Uh, so you already know where they're going to be entering. And you issue orders the same way. And the distance between the commander and the unit is always measured to the designated point of entry. Now, if the commander is also off the table, they're assumed to be within 12 inches. Now, if a division is coming onto the board, they're all considered to be given a division order and they all enter at the same time. All right, now, if there's not enough room for all the units entering a table to fit in that spot or like there's too tight or something like that, just put the lead unit uh, in column on the table 
and say that everyone else is following behind. They'll basically uh, be able to keep up with the division. Okay, now disordered units and orders. There are various circumstances where a unit can become disordered during the game. This represents temporary loss of formation and control. Disordered often follows from enemy shooting, from hand-to-hand -hand fighting, and sometimes result of movement through other units or difficult terrain. Disordered units are always indicated with a suitable marker so that the status is obvious to all. Uh, you can use a puff of smoke, little, uh, you can use a, uh, a pipe cleaner, a little ring, you can use a um, casualty marker, whatever you want to use to represent that they're disordered. And they cannot be given orders of any kind in the command part of the turn. Disordered units cannot normally use their initiative. Disorder, disordered units in open order formation can use their initiative specifically to move away. If you're disordered, you cannot use your free move. However, units in broken divisions must use their move to attempt to leave the battlefield. All right, now moving units. Okay, this is the most important part of the whole moving chapter, is being able to move them, right? <laughs> a unit in, uh, in receipt of orders can potentially move up to three times in a single turn, depending upon the result of the test when issuing orders. The total distance a unit moved during the command part of the turn varies. For example, an infantry unit can normally move 18 inches, heavy cav 27 inches, and light cav 36 inches. Okay, because why do I say that? Well, because infantry have a 6 inch move, uh, cavalry has a 9 inch, and light cav has a 12 inch. So you take that 6 times 3 potential moves, that's 18 inches. So uh, it, that's where the tape measure or a 18 inch ruler or even a 36 inch ruler will come into effect because let's say you've got a 6 inch move but you get 3 of them, uh, it's kind of hard to move 3 moves with the 12 inch ruler. So you just break out the 18 inches and you move them 18 inches. Now when you, when you move, the bases are free to move in any direction or orientation so long as the unit retains the same formation as a whole and no model moves further than the distance allowed. So, let's say, now this is where it gets tricky. Let's say I'm in combat formation, right? And you can, you can see the whole thing? Yeah, you can pretty much see the whole thing. Okay, so I'm in a combat formation and I want to move that way. You can do that, no problem. But you can't change formation unless you spend a move to change formation. But if you don't change formation, and let's say I get six inches of movement, right? Let's say I get six inches of movement. And I move this guy six inches, but I want to face him that way. Now, hypothetically, I've got to keep my guys in line, right? Because I have to stay in the same formation. Right? You're following me so far. But now this guy... Hell, he's having to move 14 inches. He doesn't have that kind of movement. He can't do that. So I would not be allowed to do this. But I could move this guy 6 inches, because remember, I only had one move. And then everybody would have to basically abide by his 6-inch move. Right? You with me? Okay, so as long as none of your models move more than what you're being asked to move, you can do it. Uh, a lot of previous games will have you wheel and do stuff like that, like they would take the outer edge if you had a six inch move and this guy would wheel out this way and then you would do that. Well, you don't have to do that. You can kind of just kind of do one of these numbers. Six inch move really does kill you when you're wheeling a long unit like that. <laughs> but you can do it. That's how you do it. Okay, so in these rules, you have freedom of movement, right? So a formation as a whole has, uh, as long as they don't, as long as one model doesn't move more than their allowed movement, you can swing about, reverse your facing, move to the right, move to the left, move at an angle, go forward, go backwards, make any comparable maneuver the player wishes to make. This is rather free and easy method of moving, and quite different to many sets of gaming rules. Okay, so uh, that's a big change, right? Because like in a lot of the games that I play, it's a very strict wheeling and maneuvering kind of game. Where in this game, it's pretty much 
you're free wheeling. Yeah, you're just moving however you want, you know, as long as the model doesn't move more than your movement. Now, what does that kind of take into effect? Well, the unit is drilled. They know what they're doing. They, they know how they're moving. Or uh, the commanders are, you're making a roll of the command move anyway. So part of that command would be getting them to run a little bit faster or run a little bit slower. Or to, to, it's, all, it's all like uh, extrapolated in that die roll. You got that one move, you can move. Okay. Proximity to the enemy. Uh, we impose a common sense uh, rule upon the free and easy approach to movement. When most and most players will do this instinctively anyway, but uh, just just in case there is a rule for it. Uh, if you have an enemy within 12 inches, right? Whoops, you turned to the side. We have an enemy within 12 inches, obviously. Your unit is obliged to face that enemy. So if they were this way and they're given an order, they're forced to turn that way. Okay, you still have to do the move and you still have to get your orders and all that and move, but they have to face the enemy. And for this rule, we ignore open order because various exceptions apply to them. We're only going to consider formed units in proper formation. Now, your unit is said to be facing its enemy if at least part of the enemy lies directly in front of your center. So, if I turn this guy this way, that's still considered facing the enemy because my center is here and we shoot a straight line out and that unit is, it is piercing that other unit. So, he is facing that unit. Now, if you're facing an enemy within 12 inches at the start of your move, you can only move either towards or away from the opposing unit while continuing to face it. This obligation overrides or governs any actual order the unit is given. This means that units cannot attempt to move around an enemy or step sideways in the face of a foe. The proximity rule obliges units to face off as the opposing armies close upon each other. Now, if I was more than 12 inches, sure, I could go to the left, I could go to the right, I could back up, I could wheel around, I could do whatever. But once you get within 12 inches of that front of that enemy, you, you're obliged to face him. It's too late. All right, now there's kind of an exception to this rule. If you have multiple units in your front, right? And the front, remember, is that arc. If you have multiple units to your front, and one of them is within 12 inches, then you go into this proximity of enemy rule. You will have to face an enemy. It does not have to be the one that's 12 inches away from you. As long as the other units that are in your front are within three moves of you. So if you are infantry, if they're within 18 inches of you, you can continue to face them. You do not have to turn and face the guy that's within 12 inches of you. Uh, if your cavalry, that might extend out to 27 inches, or light cavalry might be 36 inches. But as long as the unit is within, like hypothetically, let's say in the diagram, it kind of shows this, right? This unit is within 12 inches of my front. So now I'm in the proximity of the enemy. Or actually, this, this unit is uh, within 12 inches of me. So I'm in proximity of the enemy. But because these units are within 18 inches, I don't have to turn to face him. I do have to turn to face one of the units. So, But he's already facing this unit, so he might just stay there. But most players, if they're smart, would probably turn like this anyway. But that's up to you to decide. So when you're locked in the proximity of the enemy, then you need to determine if there's anybody else also within three moves. Proximity and open order troops. Units in formations can choose to ignore enemies in open order when it comes to proximity. 
If a unit chooses to ignore open order troops that are masking another enemy, then the unit must take account of the masked enemy as if it was as if the open order troops were not there. Uh, just because there's open order troops in between doesn't mean you can't see the second unit behind them. So you got to pay attention to that second unit. Now units in open order are not uh, affected by the proximity of enemy unless they are within six inches of the unit. So basically they're, they have six inch rule where everyone formations have a 12 inch rule. Okay, moving through enemies and combat. Units are not allowed to move through an opposing unit, although they can move over commanders freely. Commanders moved over in this way are obliged to move and described in the section on the commanders. Units cannot normally move through friends if they are engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat, but are allowed to do so if moving to join the engagement, either as support or by charging. This exception is necessary to allow for multiple charges in some situations. Now moving through friendly units. Aside from units engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat as noted above, units from the same side can move through each other where it is possible. It doesn't matter if it takes one, two, or three moves to clear the position of friends, so long as the position is cleared once the unit has finished its movement. If it is not possible for a unit to clear a friend in this way, then it may not move through. Note that it is hard for deeper units to move through, like warbands and phalanxes. Okay, units can move through friends without penalty if either unit is skirmishers or other infantry in open order. If both units are light cavalry, light chariots, or horse archers in open order. Otherwise, other units can also move through friends without penalty if only a minor portion of both units are moved through. So what they're trying to say is, let's say you've got a unit here, and you've got a unit there, and he moves through that. That's less than half of the unit, so he can move through that with no penalty. But if he was there, then he would be moving through a ma the majority or a major portion of the unit, and there might be a penalty. Okay, if the center front portion of either unit moves over the other, then it will be necessary to test for both units to determine if they're disordered. On a four, five, or six, the unit remains in good order. Otherwise, it's disordered. Disordered units suffer penalties for range attacks and in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And any disordered units that have not already moved will usually not, not be able to do so. And disorder does not usually affect units from turn to turn unless they are engaged in combat. So it's not an insufferable penalty. All right, manhandling artillery. Artillery can range in size from the smallest man portable bolt throwing machines to huge static siege engines. Here we are concerned only with a mobile field artillery of different kinds. The lightest types of man portable machines move at infantry speeds, six inches. A machine of this kind can move once in the command part of the turn and still shoot in range attacks part of the turn. If the machine moves more than once, it cannot also shoot. Heavier types of field machines can still be carried by their crew and in some cases have wheels to enable them to move more easily. Such machines can only move once in any command part of the turn and cannot move and shoot in the same turn. Okay, so what that means is you got a light bolt thrower, you can move it once and shoot it. If you move it two or three times, it can't shoot. And heaviers, no matter what your orders state, you can only move it once. No shooting. A formation change takes an entire move except in the case of skirmishers, light infantry, light cavalry, horse archers, and light chariots. In those cases, a unit can change formation to or from open order and then move, counting this as a single move. A unit can only make one formation change in each command part of the turn, no matter how many moves the unit has. It can only make one formation change. So a heavy infantry unit with three moves could not adopt open order, move through wood, and then form a battle line all in the same turn. Squares are essentially static defensive formation. A square cannot move. Units leaving a table. 
Units can leave the table in several circumstances, most commonly following a blunder or as a result of a break. Uh, note that a unit cannot return to the battlefield if it is shaken or if it belongs to a broken division. But I guess if you blunder off the table, you can still return if you're not broken. Commanders. They're treated a little bit differently when you're talking about movement. They're ignored for purposes of determining initiative, proximity to the enemy, calculating target for range attacks, or whatever. Uh, they can be moved freely uh, unless they're engaged in combat. You can move through their own side's commanders as you wish. If the unit ends its move on top of a friendly commander, then the commander model is moved sufficiently to allow the unit to take the position. A commander is moved into by an enemy unit must immediately join a friendly unit within a move's distance. Otherwise, it is deemed to have been captured. So, keep your commanders within a move distance of a friendly unit, and commanders cannot force enemy commanders to move. All right, moving commanders. Each commander is allowed to make one move as soon as he has completed issuing all of his orders. There is no need to be strict about this. It is included to help players remember to move their commanders rather than to penalize those who forgot. Commanders move 24 inches. We assume that commanders riding horses, chariots, and elephants have the sense to dismount where necessary and to impose no restriction upon them in respect to terrain. Uh, players may wish to provide both foot and mounted model to re represent their commanders to avoid the insensitive spectacle of chariots plunging through the woodlands, elephants standing upon ramparts, and other <laughs> situations of that kind. So what they're saying is, uh, you can have an elephant commander standing on a rampart, but he probably wouldn't be on his elephant. <laughs> it's just a commander. Commanders are allowed to join friendly units that are fighting in hand-to-hand -hand combat within 12 inches. If it does not matter which side's turn it is, but commanders must join the combat before any troops fight. They are not allowed to join halfway through. For this is more about commanders in the commanders section. All right, so we've gone over formations and movement, changing formation, issuing orders and blunders and division orders uh, all in this video. And I appreciate you guys coming out and checking this out. The next video, we're going to talk about terrain and ranged combat. I'll see you then.